Thank you, Reams. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to share uh, my experience as a, as a scientist and a clinician in stroke and stroke clinical care uh, with you as stroke survivors and to those interested in the human side of stroke recovery and, uh, and stroke rehabilitation. This is a, a talk that will be pretty informal, so I welcome questions as we go. In addition, Reem sent me some questions from uh, this group that um, I might kind of anticipate, and I'll conclude with those questions and answers to them, but we should really be interactive as we go. I'll just repeat the questions, I think, for the, uh, the filming so that they get on the film. So um, I have received some support from uh, the industry, uh, the biotech or pharmaceutical industry. That doesn't pertain to anything I'll talk about today. There's no interest that overlaps, but I thought I should disclose those. One of the interesting things this group knows well, but that's worth remembering as we think about uh, strategies for developing therapies in stroke, is that stroke is increasingly a disease of uh, survivorship rather than a disease that produces early death. The incidence of stroke is increasing because the population is increasing, and age is the greatest risk factor for stroke. We read about high blood pressure and high cholesterol and smoking, but it's really age that's the greatest risk factor, and as the population ages, the incidence of stroke will, is projected to increase. But at the same time, better medical care, predominantly in the emergency room and in the acute stroke service, means that the death rate for stroke is declining, which is a good thing. It fell from the third leading cause of death to the fourth leading cause of death in around 2012, and then last year it fell from fourth to fifth. Look at that, and we extend that out to weeks or months. We know that neurological recovery is occurring, beginning a couple of days after stroke and then progressing out to months. And we know that neuro rehab and what I would call training-induced plasticity really occurs in the three to six months after stroke. And many of us here will have that experience. After a stroke on the neuro rehab unit, or if you're well enough to go home and do outpatient therapies, you know that in the first three months after stroke, you're just spontaneously getting better. You work hard, but the arm will get better, the leg will get better, swallow and language will improve all on their own. And that's this early phase here of neuro rehabilitation and rehab training plasticity it starts to, though, plateau and decline. And so if we look at phases, the acute phase is when the initial damage occurs and really is over at about three days to four days after stroke. From that three to four day period to about three months is the subacute phase in which everyone gets a little better and rehab helps. And then the chronic phase is really about six months and later. And that's when you can still make gains, but it really takes a lot of work. And often, you have to focus on one thing at a time. And so in my clinic, when I see patients in chronic stroke, we'll focus on one thing, maybe walking, and really pour a lot of resources and attention and effort into that. And only then would we move to the next step, maybe arm control. The chronic phase has a lot more work, more limited gains, and a lot of focus necessary to get there. It's the subacute and chronic phases in which we're looking at these new emerging therapies of neural repair that I'll get into in a minute, I'm trying to get the pointer up here. And they, these are cell therapies, including stem cell therapies, growth factor delivery, and drugs that are kind of loosely called plasticity drugs. And this, this is sort of the metaphor of plasticity in the brain. You've probably read this in the LA Times or Newsweek Time Magazine. Plasticity in the sense that the brain is plastic. It can change shape. You can mold it a bit. Neuroplasticity, meaning you might be able to mold the, the neurons in a way that enhances their function. And so neuroplasticity drugs might change and mold the function of existing circuits to help recovery. And so this is kind of a schematic of one image of stem cells and what they look like in a dish. This is called a neurosphere. And I'll get into more of this detail here. I thought to start off with, we should discuss what's been done. Where have we come with stroke repair therapies? This is a summary of the seven uh, largest stroke clinical trials to date in, that have looked at more of the repair phase. In other words, after the first couple of days. And they've examined a couple of different things. Some have looked at specific aspects of enhancing rehab with robots or with treadmill training or with forcing 
a patient to overuse their affected arm, so-called constraint-induced motor therapy, or CIMT. Others have looked at brain stimulation. This is the Everest trial down here, which is second to last. Um, one looked at depression or a drug to prevent depression and how that affected recovery. And the final one was one of the first cell therapy trials in stroke. It, the results from this actually just became public last month. What these have in common is they helped us understand how to do these trials. W only one was positive, um, and that's this trial up here, the so-called FLAME trial that indicated, that's a spelling error there, that indicated that the drug Prozac or fluoxetine may help recovery of function if started early after stroke. What they really tell us is stroke repair trials can be done. They're going to require a lot of patients in chronic stages of stroke, like many out here, and they're going to be hard. We have to change things around a bit from how we did these earlier trials that you've probably read about, which tested stroke cell death or stroke neuroprotection. So when we think about stroke recovery therapies, what are we talking about? What are the classes of stroke recovery therapies? One class is to deliver growth factors. These are molecules that stimulate a cell to grow, or in specific, might stimulate a neuron to grow or a neural stem cell to grow. And there's been a couple of clinical trials from this, including erythropoietin, which you may know as a molecule that used to be given to kidney patients to stimulate uh, red blood cell production, and two other growth factors, a growth factor called FGF and another one called GCSF. And I'll talk about those trials in a bit. Another way to stimulate recovery after stroke might be to block the brain scar. So when you get a stroke, the brain wants to wall off the damage, and it forms a scar around that injury, the stroke injury. And this is initially a good thing because it helps keep the damage contained. But then it turns out that the scar may block the brain's ability to heal and repair. And so one set of therapies that, that may make it to a clinical trial is to block the scar-forming parts of the brain so that they can allow the rest of the brain to form new connections and heal. I'll talk most of the, the, uh, the talk today about cell therapies in stroke, including stem cell therapies. And these last two get back to what we talked about a minute ago, drugs that might promote plasticity in the brain or help the brain change its, its own connections for better function. And some of these I'll go over, some we won't have time, and I'm happy to come back and talk to a little bit later. And the final element is just enhancing the normal rehabilitation that we do. Most of you have gone through some aspect of neuro rehab after stroke, and it's pretty standard. As a matter of fact, it hasn't changed much in, in 35 years. And we're now learning that we may be able to enhance neuro rehab to promote better recovery by using robots or treadmills or by using things that I mentioned where we force patients to overuse their, their affected arm. So that's another area of active uh, thera therapy development and stroke. So the, the, these are growth factors, molecules that might diminish the effect of the brain scar, cell therapies, drugs that will promote plasticity or recovery in injured circuits, and then finally changing around and maybe updating a bit how we do neuro rehab. So I wanted to illustrate how some of these might work. So here's a, oops, keep doing that. Here's a brain. Here are two nodes in the brain. They might connect to mediate movement or language. If they have a connection that, in, that links two brain areas together, one of the most common effects in stroke is a disconnection of those areas. The damage disconnects two areas that work together to do a function. In this case, these two might work together for language. And one of the ways that it's clear the brain recovers is to develop new connections. And I thought I'd illustrate this with a map of UCLA. It kind of looks like the brain. So if one, if one wanted to do a, a, similar, a similar kind of thing, here are two nodes in the UCLA map. This connects the student union to Stan's Donuts, which many of you know, the, uh, the uh, august and longtime uh, excellent donut parlor down in, uh, in, in Westwood. And so if you were to, to, to get mo most quickly from the student union to Stan's Donuts, you'd take a particular route, the most efficient way to get there. If we had, in this metaphor, a stroke that disconnected these two nodes, 
you might still be able to go to Stan's Donuts from the student union, but you'd have to take a longer and less efficient route. You might have to even form a new connection between Stan's Donuts and the student union. And this is a lot of what happens in the brain after stroke. We can recruit circuits that could do the task and normally didn't and are less efficient at doing so. And so we might bring existing circuits more in, into a, a, a routine use or we might have to form a fully new set of connections. So the, the emerging classes of drugs are looking at stimulating those two processes, helping the student get to Stan's Donuts in existing streets that were a little bit longer, or helping create a new pathway that might link two sites that normally wasn't there ahead of time. Growth factors or drugs like that are one of, were one of the easiest and first kinds of drugs to be studied because we know about them. Growth factors help the, the body grow when it develops. They help the body uh, function normally. We know about many of them already. And so it was really easy to see, hey, if these growth factors are already in clinical use, like EPO or FGF, could we just kind of laterally move them into stroke repair and see if they help the brain grow? And they did in animal models of stroke, in many cases, help the animals recover better after an experimental stroke. So several of them went into clinical trials, and they failed. <clears throat> EPO went into a large multi-center clinical trial, getting the pointer here, in Europe. FGF went into a multi-center trial here in the United States. And GCSF, or Nupagen, went into a clinical trial also in Europe. And they all failed. And we, this was sort of a, an early lesson for stroke repair. Why did they fail? The pro they failed because here's the target. The target is the injured tissue around the stroke. And yet, when we deliver these molecules, we deliver them to the whole body. And they're powerful molecules that have effects on the whole body. So EPO was developed to stimulate red blood cell production in cancer and in kidney failure in, people, in patients on dialysis. And sure enough, it not only does it get to the brain and hopefully repair the brain, but it even has a greater effect on red blood cell production and in other areas in the body. And so one of the early lessons here is that if you deliver a, a repair drug to the whole body, its target is the brain, but its side effects will occur from the rest of the system that you deliver it to. And so a challenge now is to try to deliver systems that just get the drug to the brain or to modify molecules so that they will only have an effect on the target tissue in the brain. That work is active at UCLA and at many sites in which we're trying to engineer delivery systems so we can get these drugs specifically to the injured brain and not affect the rest of the body and produce side effects. So this is, this is a, an in-process uh, um, uh, area, and it's worth knowing about because clinical trials probably in five to seven years might come down this. So let's move to the next category, and that's cell therapy, including stem cell therapy. There are a couple different classes of cell therapy we should discuss so we get everybody on the same page. There's, of course, true stem cell therapy. There's adult stem cell therapy, which I'll get into. That often means not a true stem cell. And if we look at true stem cells, there's two different flavors now. There's embryonic stem cell therapy and what's called induced pluripotent stem cell therapy. And we'll go over these a little bit. These uh, can come you can get progenitor cells also from the bone marrow. And then we can deliver them a couple of different ways, by IV, by direct injection into the artery into the brain, or by direct injection into the brain itself. So this is a complicated slide, but I just wanted to highlight where these cells come from, what you make them into, and how you apply them to the, to the brain after an injury. So there are clinical trials in which some cells have actually been derived from fetuses. This is ethically difficult for many people, um, and, and, and so there's a problem there. It's also difficult because you can't scale these up in many cases to produce massive quantities of cells that you might need for many stroke patients. But there are ways to do that. And so several companies have used fetally derived progenitor cells to treat stroke. And I'll go over uh, those trials and what they might indicate. A second source is an embryonic stem cell. And we'll go over exactly what that means. It comes from a certain stage of an embryo. And this is the so-called ES, or embryonic stem cell. 
And these have been used to promote a couple of different aspects of repair and recovery in stroke, including helping to form the, the uh, insulating sheath back onto the connections that may have lost that, or inducing new connections to form, and possibly even protecting the brain from a stroke itself. A, a next class is what we might call progenitor cells. And what's meant by that? These are not stem cells, but these are cells that are all still immature, progenitor meaning immature, and they could form other cells in the body. And they're a different class than a stem cell, and we'll go over that. And then a final cell cut type is this bottom one. So we've talked about fetal sources, embryonic sources, adult sources of, of progenitor cells, and then adult stem cells. And this is a relatively new technology that potentially shows great promise in regenerative medicine. So what do we mean when we talk about a stem cell? What is stemness? Because we have to bring that up before we move forward. So a stem cell just means a cell that can give rise to itself. It can produce another stem cell, pardon me, or it can produce, woo, a daughter cell that can give rise to any tissue in the body. So we kind of, I think, have that sense from reading uh, the lay press. A stem cell can produce any tissue in the body, but it can also renew and produce more of itself. So that's all a stem cell really means. But we'll see as we get into this that most of the cells used in stroke are really not stem cells. They're derived from stem cells, but we're not talking about true stem cell therapy. And there's an important reason for that. Stem cells themselves like to form certain kinds of tumors. You couldn't actually put a true stem cell back into a person as a therapy for a disease because it would probably form a tumor. And so what we in the field are doing is taking these stem cells, pushing them a little bit into a more mature state, and then you working with that, mature, with that more mature state, a so-called progenitor state. So you have a stem cell and a cell that's a little more committed, a little more mature as a progenitor. It could still form many different kinds of tissues, but it can't form every tissue in the body and thus form tumors. IPS cells are a relatively new development. These were discovered in 2006, and the Nobel Prize for this discovery was awarded in 2012. The advantage here is these can be true stem cells, but they're derived from something like an adult human skin cell. So they don't have the same ethical challenges that embryonic stem cells have. You don't have to kill an embryo to get an IPS stem cell. You can take a lung cell, a skin cell, you can take even a blood cell, and you can use a series of protein factors. And in fact, this field is advancing so fast, there are other ways to do this now. And you can essentially trick them into becoming a stem cell. And so then you can take that stem cell and, and make neurons, brain cells, or other cells in the body, muscle cells, and you can use that to help regenerate brain tissue. This is the IPS cell. And the IPS cell shows great promise because in theory, although this is going to take a lot of work, you might be able to go to a stroke patient and take a cell from their skin and make a stem cell from that and then give that back to them to help repair the brain. It would be their own cell and you wouldn't need to do a lot of the messy things that might is sometimes necessary for stem cell work, which is to suppress the immune system. So the final thing to talk about is the brain has its own population of neural stem cells. And these also respond to stroke. Completely outside of a stem cell therapy, the brain's own stem cells can respond to stroke. And a lot, it, the problem, of course, is that they don't get very far or we recover better. And so a lot of the work in the stem cell field is to stimulate the brain's own endogenous stem cells to respond more completely to stroke and help repair it. So ES cells, embryonic stem cells, are true stem cells. They have ethical challenges, but they are a viable source for a regenerative medicine therapy for stroke and other diseases. I talked about iPS cells, a relatively newcomer to the field that can be taken from adult cells and can be used for repair. And then I talked about the brain's own stem cells, which we all have, and how we might use those to more completely repair the, the brain after stroke. This is kind of a map of the human brain and shows if you look, if you sort of cut it in half and look at the side, 
The stem cells in the human are in areas near the ventricles or the fluid-filled cavities in the brain, just as they are in a mouse or, or rat brain. And I'll get to that in a little bit in response to one of the questions from the audience. So the final thing is what do we mean by a progenitor cell when it comes to the brain? We talked about stem cells. They can form any tissue in the body. And then I talked about how when you push them and they become slightly more mature, they're now a progenitor. A progenitor means it's still immature and it can still form multiple kinds of tissues, but it can't form every tissue. So a neural progenitor can form all the cells of the brain, neurons and different kinds of glia, but it couldn't form a muscle cell or, or, a, or a, a blood cell. It's a little more committed. And we often will be working with neural precursors because they are a little more committed. We don't, we don't really want muscle cells to accidentally form in the brain. We want these cells to be a little more committed. These are the cells we often work with in transplantation for stroke. A final cell that's fairly common in the stroke field, which I'll conclude with when I discuss these things, is the so-called mesenchymal stem cell, or MSC. This is really not a stem cell at all. In fact, it's probably a very limited progenitor cell that normally exists in all of our bone marrows. And in the bone marrow, it helps the bone marrow function to produce new white blood cells and red blood cells. The, the thing about it is it's very easy to grow and very easy to isolate and seems to be able to modify the immune system. And so MSCs have been used very early on in the stroke repair field, and they, and they seem to work in getting preclinical uh, stroke situations better. So mouse and rat models of stroke, the MSCs seem to help. And they may do so by working the way they do normally in the body, and that's to help modify bone marrow cells or to help modify inflammation. And I'll get into that in a minute. So when we talk about transplanting cells into the body, into the brain, here are the cells that have been used so far. There are two concepts to talk about first, autologous versus allogenic or allogeneic. Allogeneic means an off-the-shelf product, a product that's not you. And this is the most common kind of transplantation. So if you were to get a, a kidney uh, from someone, that would be an allogeneic transplantation. If you, were to, if you were to get bone marrow that you got from yourself, so if, if you were to get a bone marrow transplant for a stroke in which they harvested cells from your bone marrow and gave them back to you, that's autologous. So in autologous, you get your own cells back. In allogeneic, you get cells from someone else. And because that's not you, that's a foreign source of cells, in allogeneic transplantation, you often need to suppress the body's immune system like you would for kidney or liver tra or heart transplantation. So there are a number of cells used that are either from the patient themselves or given to the patient from another source that have been used in stroke. And there are a number of companies active or considering cell therapies, mostly allogeneic. If you're a company, you want to have some monetary uh, benefit here. You want a product. And so allogeneic means you can have a bag of cells that you've produced that are not the patient's own cells, but a product, and you can give them to that patient. And so allogeneic therapies are a hot item in biotech for the brain, the spinal cord, and for other diseases. There are a number of human progenitor lines that have been used. In particular, there are a number of neural lines that have been derived from fetal sources that have gone into clinical trial from Stem Cells Inc. and one recently in stroke from a company called Reneuron. So these are that's that class of cells I talked about that come from fetuses that are progenitor cells. There are a number of trials gearing up or, in, or kind of in early development stages from embryonic stem cells. And the most famous that you may have read about was from a company formerly called Geron that developed embryonic stem cells to help repair the spinal cord. They're now a company called Asterius and they've reactivated that trial. And they're active in considering whether their cells might also work for stroke repair. Then there are these iPS cells. These are the cells that I talked about that were developed relatively newly, 2006. And we can take these cells from any patient or from a population of donors and produce neurons and in theory give them back to patients after damage. iPS-derived neural progenitors or glial progenitors. 
These aren't going to be used clinically, um, and so I, I won't cover these last two. These are, this is one uh, listing of all the clinical trials in stroke using cell therapies, and we can see that there's not a small number. Many of these are from China or India, um, and it's, it's kind of hard to understand what cells are being given and what outcome measures. The, cl the clinical trial control systems are not as strong in these countries. But what I wanted to illustrate is point number one, there's a lot of clinical trial activity. Point number two, it's sort of a scattershot. Many of them are not quite as rigorous as trials we do in the United States, so it's hard to understand what cells they're giving, why they're giving them, and what the outcome measures are. There are a smaller number of trials that satisfy the criteria that we're comfortable with here and in Europe and in some South American countries. There's only about 10 to 15 of those trials. And so far, there hasn't been a positive cell therapy trial for stroke in the United States, Europe, or in these other countries. There's a lot of activity here, and it spans the gamut. Um, but there hasn't been a positive trial yet. Many of these trials, particularly in China and in the third world, are typically doing a bone marrow isolation or isolation of fat, spinning that down and getting cells and then giving them back to the patient. So they're autologous, they're the patient's own cells, but it's not clear what those cells are. The groups are not characterizing them well enough to understand what kind of cells are going back into the patient. So early days, there's a lot of noise out there. There's, there are a lot of trials that are not that rigorous, but the dust is starting to settle, and I'll go over in my last slide what's coming down the pike that's well controlled, that might be a, uh, something to consider as a, as a true and well-run stroke repair cell therapy trial. When we talk about well-run cell therapy trials, we come to the sticky issue of what's called offshore stem cell therapies. And these are called offshore because they typically fall outside of the United States in terms of its rigorous control of the things you can inject into patients. However, as many will recall from articles, say, in the Los Angeles Times last Sunday, there's actually a lot of work with cell therapy uh, uh, procedures even in Los Angeles and in the United States that the FDA has chosen not to regulate that are in a sense entrepreneurial medicine. These people who are developing this are really functioning more as business people rather than physicians. They make an investment in something that looks marketable. There's absolutely no evidence that it's going to work in stroke or the evidence is anecdotal. A patient says, hey, I got better. And then they charge patients out of pocket because insurance companies recognizing that there's no evidence for this will not pay for it. And that's an important topic to bring up here because it's an unfortunate uh, lure for many patients because stroke is so devastating and can be such a helpless condition and a hopeless condition. But it's important to recognize that people giving stem cell therapies outside of clinical trials, out of their own clinics, are really practicing business more than medicine. And they're really marketing therapies in which they, or may, they may not or often do not have any sense of what they're giving. It's certainly not stem cell therapy. And it can, in fact, be dangerous. There are many cases in American medicine in which our intensive care units have admitted patients emergently from the third world after a stem cell therapy. And patients have been sick and, in some cases, died. And so, it could be dangerous, it's certainly unregulated, it's not stem cell therapy, and there's no evidence clinically that this works in rigorous, in rigorous tests. So it's worth bringing up. And I'm happy to answer any questions. I've had patients, my own patients from my clinic, who have gone to Tijuana for cell therapies. And I think the best thing they got down there was the massage that came after the therapy injection <clears throat> in talking to them, because it certainly wasn't beneficial medically. Okay, so. One final thing to talk about when we talk about cell therapies is, is how do you give them? These are cells, it's not a molecule. And how do you get a large complex thing like a cell into a patient as a therapy for stroke? And there's really three different ways. You could give it by vein, you could give it intraarterially, which I'll get into in a minute. We know that the new uh, stent retriever devices that made so much uh, press where they go up and pull the clot out in stroke, that's done intra-arterially through the arteries in the, in the neck and then up into the brain. You could actually use that same route to inject cells. That's intra-arterial or IA development. And then intraparenchymal, just meaning the parenchyma of the brain, a direct brain injection. You, you will, probably won't put them in the, in the ventricles, so this isn't so relevant. 
So this is the first two are systemic delivery. As I mentioned with, when I talked about growth factors, this might be a problem. You're giving it by vein or by artery, so the whole body will get those cells, not just the brain. And that might be an issue, and we'll get to that. If you inject into the brain, just the brain's getting it, and you can target the damaged tissue, but it is a brain surgery. And so that's a negative there. So there are positive and negatives to both these ways of delivering therapies. So here's an example. If you inject it into a vein, what you might see. And what we see in uh, preclinical studies here is that almost no, none of the cells, almost no cells get actually into the brain. When you give cell-based therapies, stem cell-based or otherwise, by vein, they get caught in the liver, lung, and spleen. Yet, they seem to produce functional improvement in animal models of stroke. So if they're not getting into the brain, how are they, how are they improving stroke uh, function? They appear to work by modulating the immune system. So even though stroke is damaged in the brain, what we now know is it really turns the whole body's immune system on. Heart attack does the same thing. And these cells may work by changing the body's general immune reaction to a stroke and helping the brain have less damage because of that. One, one thing that's becoming clear is that if this is the case, these cells will probably only work or may only work early after stroke, in the first day or so. In fact, a recent clinical trial using a cell therapy that's uh, related to the bone marrow found that the earlier you gave it to stroke, the, the better. And so it's likely that these intravenous delivery of cells are likely to work earlier in stroke because they really don't change the brain much. Whereas later in stroke, when you have to change a brain that's plateaued, that's gone into a chronic state, you may need to actually go into the brain with the cells to help modify that brain environment. This is IA. This is a slow catheter coming into the carotid artery there. I'll do it again for those that missed it. Um, and so this is the same approach that we might use to pull a clot out in a stent retriever device. And so there actually is a clinical trial out now from a company called Aldogen to use a, a re related approach to that and to put the patient's own cells in to see if that helps. And it is a more focused delivery. You're in the artery to the brain. However, it's still a systemic delivery because the blood circulates back out. So we'll see if that w works or not. Um, it's, it's certainly an interesting approach. And we're so now advanced in selective catheterization of brain arteries that this may provide an advantage for delivery in the future. So this kind of summarizes what I talked about. In, me, in most cases, these cells, even though delivered into a brain artery, they also do not get into brain. And so they may be modulating the immune system or some of the local damage rather than getting into the brain and changing it. The final thing is direct injection into the brain. Um, the advantage of doing this is that we're now very sophisticated and minimally invasive with brain injections. Um, we could, they're, they're, in some cases, an outpatient therapy. So many may know patients with Parkinson's disease. And we put small brain stimulators in for Parkinson's disease now routinely. And that's almost an outpatient therapy. They come in, they have it done, they go home the same day. So this is really minimally invasive brain surgery. So that's a, a, sort of a new concept for people. <clears throat> I think when people think, wow, brain injection, that means a brain surgery. This is relatively focused and minimally invasive and guided by the MRI to a very specific point. Two clinical trials have recently come out, one not quite yet, that indicate that this may work in chronic stroke. One is from a company called Sanbio, which is getting ready to have a clinical trial, a larger one in fall, for which UCLA and several California sites will be active. And another one is a company that did a trial in Europe, uh, Reneuron. And these look to have positive data. They were not uh, organized to look at effect. They were look, organized to look at safety. They look to be safe. And there may be a signature, a small hint of, of a positive effect here. So that's something to watch down the road, is that in stroke up to five years after the event, these may provide a viable way to promote recovery by directly putting the cells into the damaged tissue. There are other therapies in development that might take a similar approach. So now I'll conclude with questions from the audience. 
And, uh, and these are the questions that Reams uh, sent me. So the first one was, it used to be believed that we do not grow nerve cells. Has that belief changed? Also, can neurons regenerate? And that is the old dogma. As I mentioned, we now know there are brain stem cells. They can respond to stroke. And in many cases, they do seem to at least initially engage in repair. This is from a prominent recent paper in the journal Cell that showed that in the human, new neurons are born, even in adults, and they migrate to areas. This is kind of a bread slice look at the brain. This is the middle right here, and these are the outer edges. And cells along the ventricles here, the fluid-filled cavities, can migrate out and form new neurons, new brain cells in areas called the basal ganglia, adjacent to the ventricles. So it may be possible to recruit those in stroke and generate the brain's own new stem cells. This is a long way off, but it's a hot area in basic science studies of brain repair after stroke in my lab here at UCLA and in many others. A second question was, if stem cells can become neurons, how long does it take for them to become functional? And that is a long time. So human cells in a dish, if you grow them from embryonic stem cells or these iPS cells, you can grow human neurons in a dish now. They take months to become mature neurons. And in some of the early studies for spinal cord injury, in which human embryonic stem cells were, were uh, used to, to help reform uh, the connective sheath, the myelin in spinal cord injury, the benefit was anticipated to take months to develop because Human cells take longer to develop and become mature than many of the, the rodent cells that we often use because they're easier to work with. So at least months. So a, a human clinical trial with a cell therapy that's a human cell would in, be anticipated to take months to have an effect. How will stem cells be used for stroke? There's three things that cells could be used. First, just to return, they won't be stem cells because those would just form tumors, but there'll be cells nudged a little bit down the road, differentiated from stem cells. They might, these cells might replace lost brain. That was the earliest idea we had, is we can give these progenitors, they'll turn into brain cells, they'll form new circuits, and they'll replace the lost brain. This turned out, turns out to be a lot harder than we imagined and is likely not to be the case for most of the therapies coming down the road. They won't replace lost brain cells. Instead, number two, what they seem to do is produce factors, molecules, that stimulate the injured brain to recover more completely. They stimulate the brain to repair itself better. And so that's probably the main mechanism of action of a cell therapy and stroke, is to stimulate the brain's own recovery mechanisms. And a final one I mentioned earlier is some of these cells, particularly if given by vein or by artery, probably modulate the immune system and diminish secondary damage that the immune system might play after the, the initial stroke. So we have the initial low blood flows in, in early stroke. The immune system can come in, sometimes in a beneficial way, and sometimes in a way that plays havoc and makes damage worse. And so that might be another cell therapy effect, is to modulate the immune system. Are legitimate cell therapies currently being applied and where? And I mentioned this. The, the best thing to do is to sort of be your own advocate. And here are two sites that track clinical trials in stroke. One is from the NIH, clinicaltrials.gov, and it has search terms in which you could put stroke and cell, and then you could select for active trials. And it will cough up a list of active trials and where they are. Another valuable resource is at, is at strokecenter.org, which is, again, another nonprofit, highly informative website and you can search that in the same way to find active or recruiting clinical trials that uh, might use a cell therapy or really any neural repair therapy. These change all the time. So the best thing is to have the ball in your own court and search these to see if they're active therapies. You can also email me or the UCLA Neuro Rehabilitation Program, and we're happy to help you find these. How is or will genetic engineering be applied to the brain? This is really a hot area on the basic science end. And so you may have read, particularly in the last month, about gene editing. This is a new technique that allows us to go in and e literally edit the, the genome in ways in which we would like to modify how genes function. 
uses a technology called CRISPR-Cas technology. It's being rapidly developed for the laboratory, and a group in China tried to engineer embryos to knock out a particular blood cell gene. And this concern there is that we might do, use gene editing to change who we are as, as people. By editing an embryo, you then change all of the children of that, of that adult as it grows. And so there's a, lot of et there, there's a lot of ethical controversy here, but it's a fascinating time. It's not ready for prime time at all in a central nervous system disease, but in the future we might imagine if we identify a gene that helps the brain form new connections after stroke, we could in theory go in and turn it on. And so gene editing has a role, it's way down the road, but it's a fascinating area of biology that may have an effect. The other way that I might answer this question is through gene therapy or gene delivery. Could we deliver a gene into the brain? As you may know, this has been done in bone marrow and in liver. Go in, and if a gene is missing in a simple disease like a thalassemia um, or, say, in cystic fibrosis, we might be able to go in and deliver the missing gene. Um, this is very complicated in stroke because it's not one gene that forms a problem, and it's not one gene itself that might lead to recovery. So gene delivery is likely to have a very limited role in stroke. Another question was how can vitamins and supplements help recovery? And the unfortunate answer here is not. <clears throat> and so it would be great if it was, if we could just go to our food store, our supplement store, and get a vitamin or a supplement that would work. But these really don't. In clinical trials, they haven't worked for stroke prevention, and there's no evidence that they would work for stroke recovery. A good diet contains all we need for basic brain and bodily function, and supplementing that diet doesn't seem to help. Of course, it would be great if it did, and the internet is filled with accounts of different herbs that might help and, and impede uh, different aspects of bodily function, and that also extends to stroke recovery. A good example is the hullabaloo in the late 90s, early 2000s about St. John's wort for depression. And you can also see ginkgo biloba and other ginkgo, e ginkgo extracts used quite a lot for uh, Alzheimer's disease and other things. One important concept here is these really aren't herbal uh, or natural treatments anymore when they get into the, the health food store. They're really very close to drugs. There's nothing natural about these anymore. They're purified and they ha they're potent. And they can have profound side effects. It's not like taking a multivitamin. St. John's wort, for example, produced a significant amount of toxicity to the liver. And so it wasn't a benign supplement. It induces the liver and fouled up other drugs like Coumadin and also produce liver side effects in many patients. Ginkgo can cause hypertension and other side effects. And so these aren't just benign plants harvested from a magical source in the rainforest that might have an unexpected benefit that modern medicine missed. They're powerful drugs purified to some degree and sold as a supplement in an, in an unregulated market, and so it's something to be suspicious about. Is there value in hyperbaric treatments for stroke? Hyperbaric oxygen has been around a while. It has really only two approved clinical uses, and that's to treat chronic non-healing ulcers in the leg and to treat the diving accident called the bends when somebody doesn't decompress properly coming up from depth while diving. All the rest is unfortunately, again, entrepreneurial medicine. If I were a physician and I bought a hyperbaric unit for $15,000, I'm gonna to have to make that money back. And so I might get a website, and I might advertise it for other things in which it seems like it could have an effect. And if stroke is lack of oxygen from a blood clot, then it makes sense in, a, in kind of a, an armchair kind of way, sitting there thinking, well, then giving more oxygen later might help. But the actual lack of oxygen is short-lived. It's really hours after stroke in which lack of oxygen is a, has a major role. After that, the oxygen balance in the brain is restored. The tissue that needed that oxygen unfortunately died, but after that, the clot is removed, new blood comes back in. There isn't a need for more oxygen in, these, in the weeks to months after stroke. And so there's no role for hyperbaric oxygen, and there's really no theoretical role in why it might have an effect. It's again, professional medicine, entrepreneurial medicine, and not true therapeutic medicine that's operative here. How is brain cooling now being used for stroke? And this is an area in early stroke that's, that's, that looks very promising. Cooling the brain 
acts through multiple mechanisms to slow down its damage and its death. And so brain cooling clinical trials, there are at least six of them that are looking at cooling patients down in the first six or so hours after stroke to help prevent the damage and allow doctors to get in and open the blood vessel up. It's, it's, not, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's problematic to do. It requires uh, devices to cool the body, and it's associated with side effects, particularly infections. And so it, can only, it should only be done at centers that are expert at it. But it looks promising in early stroke as a way to possibly save brain that's at risk and may move into more clinical utility. Right now, some of you may know for when, when we have a heart attack or a funny heart rhythm and it stops pumping, that we often use cooling because when the heart stops pumping, the brain doesn't get blood. And cooling the, the brain while we get the heart going is now a common protocol. So cooling is out there and it may have a role in early stroke. And then this question, embryonic stem cells were controversial. How else are stem cells now being harvested? And I went through this in detail. Embryonic stem cells are indeed derived from killing an embryo, an embryo at the pre-implantation stage in its normal development into the uterus. And that is ethically challenging for a lot of people. So a lot of research has shifted over into iPS cells, which can be made from an adult cell, like a skin cell, can also be made into a stem cell, it's not exactly yet proven to be a true stem cell, but it's utilized to form all the tissues in the body. So functionally, it's just like one. And so it's an important area of research that we might be able to make patient-specific stem cells for use in disease. So this is the last slide, because I wanted to con conclude with what's coming down the pike. What might be both immediate and intermediate stage therapies for stroke? What are the future of neural repair therapies in stroke? The first is what I might call stem cells 1.0. And this is to use these bone marrow cells or MSCs. They're easy to get. We can just harvest the bone marrow and get them. There are clinical trials ongoing with these. They're often giving the patient's own bone marrow cells back to them because they have progenitors in them. And, and there's not much intellectually to doing this. There are stem cells 1.0 kind of the lowest hanging fruit, easiest to do. They're probably only going to work early in stroke because of their mechanism of action, but they represent a bona fide cell therapy that may have effect. Stem cells 2.0 is possibly a year or two down the road, but for sure five to six. And these are using more specialized progenitor cells, in some cases ES-derived or, or possibly IPS-derived, that, that can form neurons or that more, may more dramatically repair the brain. These are likely to be directly injected in the brain. So the, these will be a brain delivery, but they seem to carry a greater potential for improving brain function after stroke it, months to years after the event. So that would be stem cells 2.0. Not here yet, but possibly close. Several, either ongoing clinical trials beginning this fall or in the next couple of years. The, the third thing is we're probably going to develop therapies that will modulate the brain's own gro growth programs. So after stroke, everyone gets a little bit better. Some patients substantially so. The brain has an ability to grow new connections and to grow and respond to injury. And a class of drugs is likely to take advantage of that and stimulate it to further effect. That's, again, further down the road, but we have a lot of research that looks promising there at UCLA and other places. The final thing is to stimulate the brain's own circuits, not grow them, not change them, but bring them back into more functional relevance. So my lab and others has found that stroke stuns the tissue adjacent to it, and it doesn't function well. And so a, a promising therapy is to deliver a drug that stimulates the ex excitability of that and brings it online so it functions back into a real circuit to make the adjacent brain less stunned, more excitable, and more functional. That looks promising, and there are several pharmaceutical companies that have drugs that can do that and that are actively exploring clinical trials in stroke to, to develop that. So that concludes uh, the talk. Um, and uh, I unfortunately have to get to another meeting after this. So I can, I'm happy to take questions. You have Reem's contact information. Don't hesitate to send me questions. I'll, I'll answer them. 
Um, we have a number of other investigators who do neuro repair after stroke that will presenting, be presenting to this group in the months to come. And so it, this, the important thing here is this represents a great interaction, how people who have had stroke interact with the, with the scientists and physicians studying how to better repair it. We can learn from you and you can learn from us. And I think this is the beginning of several lectures and interactions in which we can really foster that, uh, that collaborative uh, way of going forward. Thank you.